Model comparisons! Oh yeah! I know you've been waiting for this because I have. Y'all remember back in the day when I said that statistics suck at telling you if a model fits? But guess what it's super good at? It's excellent at saying which of two models fit better. Not to mention, science often progresses that way by comparing competing models. Behaviorist versus cognitive. Psychoanalytic versus behaviorist. Newtonian physics versus special relativity. That's how science works, people. We got two models, we compare them against each other. But first, let's go over some terminology. There are two types of models, a nested model and a non-nested model. If one model is nested within another model, that means that you can eliminate elements from one model in order to get the other model. For example, suppose we have outcome is equal to intercept plus slope 1 times predictor 1 plus slope 2 times predictor 2 versus model 2. Outcome is equal to intercept plus slope times predictor 1. Notice that if we delete predictor 2, model 1 becomes model 2. Or model 2 is nested within model 1. We call model 1 the full model and we call model 2 the reduced model. Okay, so what does it mean? So here's basically what it means. We know that variable 1 is important already. Maybe it's the relationship between IQ and GP. We already know that IQ is going to increase your GPA, but now the question is, if we add a second variable, is it important enough to keep in the model? So for example, you might already have a model with IQ predicting GPA, but maybe now you want to add socioeconomic status. And again, the question is, is it worth it? And to answer that question, we need to talk about the complexity versus fit trade-off. Alright, let me level with you. Every time we add a predictor to a model, guess what happens? It will always improve the fit of the model. Or at least it can't decrease the fit. So what's to stop us from throwing everything we have in the model? GPA is equal to intercept plus slope 1 times high school GPA plus slope 2 times SAT plus slope 3 times SES plus slope 4 times essay quality plus slope 5 times height plus slope 6 times weight plus slope 7 times handedness. Yeah, we could do that. And if we added height and weight and handedness, it's going to improve the fit of the model. Because it has to. Or, again, at least, it can't make it any worse. But there is a cost! Okay, what's the cost? The cost is called... Overfitting. Overfitting means we have fit both the signal and the noise. Overfitting means that because we fit the noise that some of the patterns that we find are just chance patterns. They're not going to happen again. So if we were to repeat the study using the same model, guess what? That same model is going to fit poorly in the second model. It's going to suck! And here's a graphic to illustrate that. So on the x-axis is model complexity, or for our purposes, it's the number of variables we have in the model. So notice that your fit, which is the y-axis, improves up to a point as you add more variables. And then, eventually, it starts going downhill, indicating that you have overfit the data. And you will poorly generalize your model across different situations. You good? You got it? A okay? Good? Okay? Good? Right? Got it? You okay? Understand? Okay. So back to our original question. What exactly is the cost of adding more variables? The more variables we add, the more likely we are to overfit our data. And the more likely we are to have a model that doesn't replicate on an independent sample. That right there, my friends, is the trade-off. Now back to our original question. When comparing our two models, we want to know, is it worth it to add these new predictors? Or in other words, is it worth the risk of overfitting to improve our fit? Or another way to say it, does the full model improve our fit enough to justify the added complexity. That's a model comparison question, y'all! And it turns out Stats is really good at answering that sort of question. We have many tools at our arsenal. A who's who of statistics. We've got semi-partial R-squared, the AIC, or Akaiki's information criteria, the BIC, or the Bayesian information criteria. We've got the Bayes factor, and we've got p-values. Did he just say p-values? <gasps> Um, aren't you, like, diabolically opposed to p-values? No, I'm opposed to how they are traditionally used. And yet, you're suggesting we use p-values. Because we are gonna use them differently! I am opposed to null hypothesis significance testing. See the link in the description for more information on that. NHST asks whether a certain parameter is different from zero. Like a group's mean, or a mean difference, or a correlation coefficient, or a slope, or an intercept. But that's a stupid question! And model comparisons ask a totally different question. Is the added complexity of the model justified? Or does the fit improve enough to risk overfitting? Or is this more complex model a better representation of reality? So NHST answers a pretty useless question. Is this parameter different from zero? 
while model comparisons invite us to ask theoretically motivated questions. And there's another reason. Another reason why I'm not opposed to p-values in model comparisons. Remember this thing? NHST will test whether every possible parameter is distinguishable from zero without adjusting for multiple comparisons. And in that situation, it is all but impossible not to p-hack. See the link in the description to learn about p-hacking. For example, suppose we have two models. Full model. GPA is a function of high school GPA, SAT, SES, essay quality, height, weight, and handedness. And the reduced model is a function of high school GPA, SAT, SES, and essay quality. Null hypothesis significance testing will perform nine tests. One for every single parameter plus the fit of the entire model. And that's not including interaction terms. So with nine comparisons, our probability of committing the type one error goes from 0.05 to 0.37 you almost have a 50-50 shot of making an important discovery that isn't even there. But with model comparisons, there's only one test. The full model versus the reduced model. So it makes it much less likely that people are gonna p-hack. But at the same time, p-values are not my favorite metric. We still have the same requirements that we had before. You have to specify your sample size in advance. You have to meet all the statistical assumptions. You can only perform one test. And the interpretation is still the same as it was before. It is the probability of observing the difference that we observed or greater if the models were the same, which is kind of a weird question, but it's some evidence. And as long as we do not use it in isolation as our only way to determine significance, I'm okay with it. So besides p-values, we have other metrics. Remember R squared? R squared is basically a measure of how perfect our fit is. It ranges from zero to one. Zero means completely imperfect fit. One means completely perfect fit. And one of the advantages of R-squared is that we can use it for multivariate data. If we have lots and lots of predictors, we can compute R-squared. And R-squared will tell you how all of our variables combined are able to predict the outcome variable. So wouldn't it be cool if we could compare the R-squared of the full model to the R-squared of the reduced model and see how much that little bit of extra information improves our fit? Yeah, totally, we can! So if the full model R-squared is 0.43 and the reduced model is 0.42, what does that tell us? Adding that extra complexity only improved our fit by 1%. Loosely translated. See the technical side note in the description. On the other hand, if our full model R squared was 0.43 and our reduced model R squared was 0.13, the added complexity improves our fit by 20%. Loosely translated. The difference between R squares of the full versus the reduced is called a semi-partial R squared. Why? Don't worry about it. All you need to know is that it tells us how much we improve the fit of our model by adding these additional predictors. Another favored metric is the Bayes factor. Bayes factor tells us the probability that the full model is true relative to the probability that the reduced model is true. So if you have a Bayes factor greater than one, that tells us that the full model is more likely than the reduced model. And if Bayes factor is less than one, that tells us the reduced model is more probable than the full model. And typically, we use these benchmarks for Bayes factor. From one to three, they say, it is not worth a bare mention. Remember, they invented this a long time ago when people talked kind of funny. You talk funny. I know, right? A Bayes factor between three and 10 means moderate evidence for the full model. Between 10 and 30 indicates strong evidence. 30 to 100 is very strong evidence and greater than 100 is decisive evidence. And if you get values that are the inverse of that or one over one through three or three through 10 or whatever, that means it is not worth a bare mention favoring the reduced model or decisive for the reduced model or whatever. Of course, you could always invert it so it's positive, which I will show you how to do in R. But my software and my package defaults to comparing the full to the reduced. So the full is in the numerator. Let's review real quick. So to determine the fit of one model relative to another model, we have several metrics. We can use p-values, semi-partial R-squares, the Bayes factor, but there are two others, which we call the AIC and the BIC. AIC for Akaiki's information criteria. Akaiki was a Japanese statistician and his name is just so much fun to say. Go ahead, say it right now. Akaiki. Uh, okay, do it again. Akaiki. Akaiki, 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 Akaiki. Boy, that's fun! And the BIC, or the Bayesian Information Criteria. But before we talk about the AIC and the BIC, let's talk about non-nested models. Remember, nested models mean you can delete part of the full model to get the reduced model. Non-nested models means you cannot delete one part of one model to get the other model. Make sense? 
So for example, model one might be GPA is equal to intercept plus slope times high school GPA, whereas model two is GPA is equal to intercept plus slope times ACT. You can't delete high school GPA and suddenly get ACT or vice versa. These are non-nested models. And if you wanna know which model is better, well, that's a tough question to answer because they're not nested. Why is it a tough question to answer? Well, remember earlier I said, when you add a predictor to a model, it must get better, at least do no worse. Well, there's no guarantee of that with non-nested models. There's no theoretical reason one model should be always preferred over another. Before we could ask if the added complexity was enough to justify the change in fit. But now we can't even answer that question because there's no theoretical reason to suspect one model is always gonna fit better than the other model. So when we use non-nested models, we can't use p-values. We also can't use semi-partial r-squareds. And we probably even shouldn't use full r-squares because now the two models are incomparable. But we still can use Bayes' factor. And we can use two new metrics, the AIC and the BIC. Aka iki, aka iki, aka iki, aka iki, aka iki. So the AIC and the BIC were specifically designed to compare non-nested models. Both statistics penalize models when they add predictors to them. But unfortunately, neither the AIC nor the BIC are really that intuitive. There are no magic benchmarks we can use. So instead what we do is we just choose whichever model has a lower AIC or a lower BIC. And in the next video, I'm gonna show you how to do that. Or in other words, we're gonna compare models, both nested versions and non-nested versions. And along the way, we're gonna see how we can go about trying to figure out how to choose the right model. But first, let's review our learning objectives. Number one. The significance testing approach versus the model comparison approach. With NHST, we test whether a particular parameter is different from zero. But with model comparisons, we test which of two models is better. Number two, understand the difference between a nested and a non-nested model. Remember, nested model means you can delete part of the full model to get the reduced model. And non-nested means you can't delete part of one model to get the other model. Number three, understand the complexity versus fit trade-off. In short, the more predictors you add, the more complex your model is going to be, the more likely you are to overfit your data. Number four, or whatever number we're on, understand at least two reasons why p-values are okay in model comparisons. First reason is because we're not testing a useless question if a parameter is different from zero. Second reason is because you're only doing one test, testing the reduced against the full model. Whereas with NHST, you're usually testing lots of models when you're doing multivariate GLMs. Number five. Understand what metrics we have available to compare models. P-values, semi-partial correlations, Bayes factor, AIC, and BIC. And number six, understand which of these metrics can be used for non-nested models. The Bayes factor, the AIC, and the BIC. So, until next time.